Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We are so glad that you have uh, joined us for this session. We're going to be looking at the book of Revelation especially the first part where it gives some information and guidance to the churches. And I want to read the information that was given to the last church. So turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and let's look at verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Thou art neither hot, cold, nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not, that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the most scathing things in Scripture. Yeah. And uh, let's see if we can put that together as we go through these churches. Great. Good idea. Well, one of the first questions we need to ask ourselves when we look at this chat, Revelation 2 and 3, where it talks all about the churches, is what churches is he talking about? Now there's good evidence that there were actually local congregations in these various sites. Um, if you were to look at a map, it goes Ephesus, Myrna, Pergamon, like this around, and not a circle, but sort of a, a loop, if you will, and back to almost Ephesus, uh, these, these seven churches we're talking about here. And were those the ones he was talking to, John was thinking about when he wrote this? Now he's out on the Isle of Patmos, he's in exile, and he's thinking about his friends that are over there. Is that what he was writing to? Some people think that's what he was writing to, and only that. Um, other people think that um, it's possible that he was referring to something different. Uh, some people think maybe this is referring to different denominations, or m maybe religious movements down through the generations. Is that possible? Um, some people think that these uh, seven churches refer to seven phases of time or periods of time in the history of the Christian church. Uh, that, of course, assumes that God is able to predict the future. And I don't think any of us here have a question about that, but many people do. Many do not believe that God has ability to predict the future. And they basically say, whatever you're going to read here in the book of Revelation it has to refer to something back there in the days of the Roman Empire and the local churches there. Well, we don't know very much about each of these local churches, uh, so that would mean that we're sort of in, dark, in the dark about what these messages are, to whom they were written anyway. Um, but there are some hints about the idea that we might refer to future events. Compare it with the book of Daniel, for example. We see in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and 9 and 10 to 12, there are clearly references by name to events happening far in the future in Daniel's day. Now, some want to place Daniel way later 
and refer to something that happened much long time after the real Daniel lived. But even if you want to do that, which I don't think is, I don't think there's less and less validity for doing that with modern archaeology and so forth. But even if you do that, Daniel covers periods, things that are going to happen all the way to the end of this world. So put it down a couple more hundred years, it still doesn't leave you out, you know, let you off the hook for, for predicting the future. So um, some thinks that these are, some of the predictions in these books, I mean in these churches, particularly the ones about Smyrna and Philadelphia, we'll look at up later, talk about fairly specific events that are coming. And we can look and we can say, did, if this is we're talking about events down through history, did those events happen at the time when it was predicted? So let's start off with the book of Ephesus. Um, is, if you want to turn in your, in your Bibles, uh, let's just look at that, Revelation 2, 1 to 7. I'm looking at uh, the, the Good News Bible. And um, we have here, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know what you have done. I know how hard you have worked and how patient you have been. I know that you cannot tolerate evil people and that you have been testing. You have tested those who say they are apostles but are not and have found out that they are liars. You are patient. You have suffered for my sake and you have not given up. But this is what I have against you. You do not love me now as you did at first. Think how far you have fallen. Turn from your sins and do what you did at first. If you don't turn from your sins, I will come to you and take your lampstand from its place. But this is what you have in your favor. You hate what the Nicolaitans do as much as I do. If you have ears then, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To those who win the victory, I will give the right to eat the fruit of the tree of life which grows in the garden of God. But he says if you don't do what he asks, he's going to take candlestick out of his place. Does that, Im is in that, is it implied that he's going to give it to some, the candlestick to someone else? Well, at least it's, presumably if you remove it, it's not giving us light anymore. So that's not a good sign, since Christians are supposed to be a light to the world. But does it imply that there will be a successor? There's no information about any kind of successor to, okay. to that. No. So uh, we have some information about these churches, and, and this is general information that might help us to understand the messages. So um, a friend of ours, C. Mervyn Maxwell, wrote a book entitled God Cares, Volume 2, and we're just going to read what he says about the book, uh, about the church, each of these churches. First of all, Ephesus. Okay. Myra? Ephesus was the principal city in the Roman, Roman province of Asia. It was not the capital. Pergamum was, but it had a fine harbor and its location was at the head of the important east-west highway. It helped it to become a strong commercial center. Ephesus enjoyed wide respect as the pagan religious center, Artemis, a many-breasted goddess of fertility, also known as Diana, was worshipped there. You can see more on that in Acts 19.35. Her magnificent temple was known to contemporaries as one of the seven wonders of the world. Yeah, in fact, uh, that temple, you know, we go to Athens to see the, Par the Parthenon, and you just, you just sit there and your mind's boggled to think how in the world did they do that without any mechanical learning. Well, this temple in Artemis, of Artemis in Ephesus was several times larger than the Parthenon in Athens. How in the world did they, I mean, Think about this, you've got this gargantuan temple with no support in the middle, pillars, all, these huge stone pillars all around. How do you put that up there without any, without any machines to do it for you? Fill it full of dirt and stand on it. You, I, it must have <laughs> done something like that. Did. They almost had to. Yeah. I mean, how else would you explain that kind of stuff? Well, we know a little bit about the church at Ephesus. How did the church get started there? Do you remember? It was Paul, remember, he traveled through Ephesus on his way back home from Corinth, 
And when he got to Corinth, the people there said, and apparently there were already a few Christians, they said, please come and spend some time with us. And he had, Paul had Aquila and Priscilla traveling with him. And he said, well, I, I, I'm on a mission now. I have to get back to Jerusalem. But I'm going to leave Aquila and Priscilla here. They'll help you. And then I will come back later. And, and he actually came back and spent three years there at Ephesus. So it had a very strong start. And did, did the Apostle John know anything about Ephesus? He lived there, didn't he? And he oh. took uh, Jesus' mother, Mary, there, I understand. There are there's records in the ancient uh, documents to suggest that, that Mary was taken care of by, by John. Some of those records suggest that he waited in Palestine until she died, and then he went to Ephesus. Other records suggest that maybe he took her with him to Ephesus. We, we, we just don't know which of those sort of records uh, to, to be believed. Um, but we believe that she died before he went to, to the island. Yes, yeah, oh yeah, way before. She would have been 120 years yeah. old or something like, <laughs> okay. by that time. Yeah, yeah she, was di she was dead before he was out on the, on the island of, of Patmos for sure. Well, but John spent a long period of time apparently shepherding the church in in Ephesus, and since that was a sort of publication center and a center for the churches in that area, he no doubt had traveled around to these other churches, probably on numerous occasions, and knew them each personally. Uh, he mentions there the Nicolaitans. Do we know anything about the Nicolaitans? It says here that they taught that you could eat food that was offered to idols and practice immorality in the name of religion. Yes. And that's actually a comment from Irenaeus uh, in his book, Irenaeus Against Heresies. Irenaeus, or Irenaeus was lived in Lyon in France, um, about 140 to 220. So you see, he, he started, he, he was born, and he, he ministered very soon after John was dead. Uh, and he said this, the Nicolaitans are the followers of that Nicholas who was one of the seven first ordained to the diaconate by the apostles. Uh, now, we don't know for sure that that's accurate information. It may have been a different Nicholas, but that's a possibility. Remember of the seven deacons that were chosen? Nicholas was one of them. Who's a diaconate? That's a, the, the deacons. The deacons. Yeah, the deacons. My, the RSV study Bible says that it probably was not that particular. Yeah, well, Nicholas, I, I would so doubt. Or would I would argue. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's probably a different Nicholas, but that's a possibility. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. These are, these are uh, Arrhenius' words. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. The character of these men is very plainly pointed out in the Apocalypse of John. That's what we're reading, the, the God, uh, Revelation. Uh, the other name for it is Apocalypse. When they are represented as teaching that it is a matter of indifference to practice adultery. In other words, it doesn't matter if you do it or not. And to eat things sacrificed to idols. Wherefore, the word has also spoken of them thus, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And that was written very soon after John was dead. So but that's that probably a good clue. That was the embodiment of the separation of the body and the spirit concept yeah. of, of, of yeah. the Greeks. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And clearly these people didn't think that the Ten Commandments should apply to them, Obviously. for example. So did these people even claim to be Christians? They did. They claimed to be Christians. They claimed to belong to the Christian church. And basically, the saddest thing about this is that here's a church with absolutely, you know, stellar beginnings with Paul and John and Apollos was there for some time and Aquila and Priscilla. I mean, what more could you ask for, right? And yet, they're deteriorating. And Unfortunately, that is very commonly the picture of Christian churches down through the ages. They get a stellar start with people who are just zealous about what they believe, and they, they're out there, they're teaching people, they're evangelizing, and so forth. And then the second generation isn't quite as zealous, and by the third generation or fourth generation, it sort of died down to a quiet, you know, murmur, if you will. And uh, we don't want that to happen to us, do we? Well. If it does, it doesn't sound very good. No. If you read this. It doesn't. <laughs> well, and this Ephesus church, if, we're, if we try to fit it in historically, it 
covers the time period from the beginning of the apostles, which would be back around maybe 35 AD when they really started spreading out, spreading the gospel, up to about 100 AD. <clears throat> and the next church is one called Smyrna. And um, Carrie, I think you're going to tell us about that. Yes. The city of Smyrna was located north of Ephesus on a beautiful inlet of the Aegean Sea. Commercially, Smyrna was a rival to Ephesus and in time far outstripped it. We're interested to know that Smyrna boasted the only known three-level market plaza in the ancient world, with stores on two levels above ground and others in the basement. Under the name of Izmir, Smyrna still survives the third largest city in Turkey and the most flourishing of the seven cities named in Revelation 2 and 3. Within about 70 years after this prophecy was made, Smyrna became the size of a notable series of martyrdoms, site rather, of a notable series of martyrdoms spread over a period of several lit literal days. The twelfth and last of the martyrs was grand old Polycarp, who by the time he died had served as principal minister of the Smyrna church for at least 40 years. At a very advanced age, Polycarp was arrested in a farmhouse one Friday night. Uh, it tells us, too, that he suffered about the year 167 A.D. in the reign of Marcus Aurelius. His great age of 86 years implies that he was a contemporary with St. John for nearly 20 years. Immediately, he asked a farmer's wife to prepare supper for the soldiers that had come to arrest him. While the soldiers ate, Polycarp stood to one side in a small cottage and prayed aloud for two hours for every Christian he could think of in the Roman Empire. Amazing. At the Smyrna Amphitheater next day, Governor Status Quadraticus was deeply impressed with Polycarp and tried to save his life. When his efforts proved futile, the governor asked Polycarp to curse Christ. He was certain that so grand a man as Polycarp would be eager to separate himself from Jesus, whom Rome had condemned as a criminal. But Polycarp gave a ringing response. Eighty and six years have I served him, and never has he done me wrong. How can then I curse him, my king, who saved me? The crowd, including in this instance members of the Jewish synagogue, screamed for Polycarp to be fed to a lion. But the lions had just gorged themselves on other non-Christian victims. A herald explained that anyway it was past the hour in the day's entertainment when li using lions was still legal. So the crowd demanded that Polycarp be burned to death. When the governor consented, the Jews, in a most unusual gesture of hostility, were foremost in gathering firewood, even though it was the Sabbath. Various Christian writers in the second and third centuries asserted that the Jews were often active in promoting persecution. However, the martyrdom of Polycarp is the only trustworthy and contemporary account of an actual martyrdom that reports actual participation by Jews. So, that's quite a story. Yes. Imagine having someone like that as your pastor for 40 years. I'm surprised that they got away with it, considering all the persecution that was going on, that he could even stay in one spot. You'd think that they would have to, you know, move around to sort of keep themselves hidden, but apparently he did. Do we have many writings of Polycarp? We have some. Yeah, uh, I don't know what you consider many. I, I haven't looked at a number of pages, but yeah, we do have some. And he was, um, some people consider him one of the early popes. So uh, that might be of interest to some, especially now that we're in the process of choosing a new pope. Um, so the next church, I mean the next city that we go to is Pergamum. The Dennis? church of Pergamum was located on a high mountain spur, making it an easy site to defend. In the 2nd and 3rd centuries BC, Pergamum, capital of a kingdom with the same name, was an illustrious cultural center. Its library contained 
200,000 scrolls. Many of these scrolls, incidentally, were made of parchment, a highly refined form of leather. Parchment was developed in Pergamum when King Ptolemy V of Egypt cut off the export of papyrus scrolls from his country. <laughs> Economic sanctions didn't work any better then than they do today. They stimulated the competition to produce a superior product. Yes. Parchment is a modification of Pergamon. King Attilus III stipulated in his will that at his death, Pergamon should be made a part of the Roman Empire. In 133 BC, this was done. As the new capital of the province of Asia, Pergamum would now claim the residence of the Roman governor. As time passed, Pergamum could also boast of temples to several pagan gods, including, ominously, the first known temple, 29 BC, to Emperor Augustus. Later, another temple was dedicated to the worship of Emperor Trajan, and much later, another temple to Emperor Servius. Okay, so interesting church, I mean interesting city. Mm -hmm. What about the message that was given to them? Well, we probably ought to look at that one. That's an interesting one. Turn to Revelation chapter 2, and we'll start with verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, this is the message from the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you live, there where Satan has his throne. You are true to me and you did not abandon your faith in me even during the time when Antipas, my faithful witness, was killed there where Satan lives. But there are a few things I have against you. There are some among you who follow the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak how to lead the people of Israel into sin, by persuading them to eat food that has been offered to idols and to practice sexual immorality. That sounds a lot like what we said yeah, about the people from the Nicolaitans in the Ephesus church. In the same way, you have people among you who follow the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Here we are again. Now turn from your sins. If you don't, I will come to you soon and fight against those people with a sword that comes out of my mouth. If you have ears, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To those who win the victory, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give each of them a white stone on which is written a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, we've looked at two or three of these churches, and we haven't read the messages, but we read the one to Ephesus. You read the one to Laodicea. We, I just read the one to, to Pergamum. And we noticed something interesting about those. There's a message. Usually there's some comments, sometimes the positive comments, and then some fairly severe warnings. And then it says, listen. And then it says, to those who overcome, there will be some kind of reward. In each church, there's a different kind of reward. But all of these rewards clearly seem to imply something that will, you will receive when? Heaven. These, when? Heaven. In heaven. These, these are rewards that you would expect to get when you get to heaven. So clearly, God found people he, could, he considered savable in each of these churches. Now, I don't think we mentioned that Smyrna, uh, that we read about, represents, it seems to represent a time period from about 100 A.D. to 313 A.D. What was happening during that time? Time of great persecution. It was a time of changing emperors. There were episodic periods of terrible persecution for Christians, especially at the beginning and the end of that time period. Sometimes in the middle they weren't persecuted that much. But it was a time when the general doctrine was you need to worship the emperor, you need to, you know, and people were required to go and, and at least once a year take a small offering and place it on a, an altar in worship of the emperor. And if you didn't do that, you could be killed. So it wasn't a wasn't a friendly time for Christians. In my New American Standard, it also calls it a synagogue of Satan. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, they, uh, we mentioned that Satan lives there, you know, yeah. that's, what, yeah. that's what the text said. Okay. So what does that refer to? The synagogue of Satan? Yes. Well, the synagogue is, the, is a Greek word 
but it's used by the Hebrews to refer to their places where they worship. Where they sure. synagogue means a place to come together, to gather together. But the significance of Satan. What okay, mean? so he's suggesting that you know terrible things. You're talking about Pergamum, right? Or you, yeah, Pergamum. What he's really talking about is this. If we look at the time period for Pergamum, it starts about 313 and goes to 538. What was happening at that time? The Roman Empire was, was rapidly fast. decaying. It yes. was rapidly decaying. And it ends with uh, the emperor, uh, Justinian, who was in Constantinople, mm -hmm. And was very much a protector and of of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, so he he sent his general Belisarius mm -hmm. into North Africa to wipe out the the Vandals who yeah. had a certain heresy. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, he marched into into Italy yeah. and wiped out the Visigoths. Mm -hmm. Now he had established in his Justinian code in 533 that the Pope would be the, the head of all churches. Yeah. The Bishop of Rome in those days. Yeah. Okay, the Bishop of Rome. Uh, so he would be the head of all churches, but it wasn't until 538 that Belisarius came into Italy and liberated Rome. Rome. Yeah. And that period began, you, you're talking about Justinian, that's sort of the end of that period, that period began with the Emperor Constantine. And what did Constantine do? Converted. Well, Constantine... Syncretism. Yeah. <laughs> Constantine, <laughs> Constantine um, was a general before he was an emperor. And he set out because there were two other generals that had uh, organized their forces to, to fight against you know, they were they were headed for Rome. They were going to conquer Rome, and they were going to take charge. And he started out with his group. And as they were on their way to battle, he looked up and he saw what he thought was a cross in the in the clouds up above. And he says that must be a hint that we need to be Christians. And so he promised on his way to battle that if he could if he could win that battle, he would go back to Rome and he would become a Christian. He would make Christianity the major religion of the. Roman Empire. And he did win the battle, and he went back and he marched his soldiers through the Tiber River and said, now you're all Christians. And the official word went out, we're now going to become a Christian empire. And of course, Norm mentioned the syncretism. Uh, what happens when you do something like that? People don't want to give up their old customs. They want to stick with their old habits and so forth. So they sort of, those people who didn't really care about so much about what the beliefs themselves, they sort of crowded into the Christian church with all their pagan practices. And there was a tremendous upheaval. And there were only a few people, a few Christians left who really, really were true to the, to the church. Many of them began in all sorts of, Christ, uh, of pagan things came into Christianity. And um, so I think this is why we want to call it, the, why the Bible calls it the synagogue of Satan. It's, it's a time of, of real, real bad stuff. Um, we have still a lot, several churches to talk about, but uh, our time is running out for, for, for this half, so we're going to ask you to stand by. Don't go away. We'll come back, and we'll go talk about the other churches that are mentioned here in Revelation 2 and 3.
Welcome back. We're delighted you decided to stay with us. Hope you're enjoying a little bit of historical background on some of these churches. We turn now to the church of, or the city in the church of Thyatira, which historically seems to fit with a period of time starting about 538 and running up till the, the, the Protestant Reformation really gets a foothold around, around about the 1550s or 1560s. Jim, you want to tell us a little bit about Thyatira? That's reading from Mervyn Maxwell's uh, book. The city of Thyatira was not a seaport like Ephesus and Smyrna. Standing on only a gentle rise, it was not defended by mountain slopes like Pergamon. But its location on the main highway, where two valleys meet, provided it with ample trade. Madder roots, which grew nearby, provided its craftsmen and merchants with a bright red dye known in ancient times as purple. Lydia, the businesswoman who accepted Christ in the city of Philippi, sold bright red fabrics and dye stuffs, purple goods, that she obtained from Thyatira. Or Thyatira, excuse me, I think I pronounced that wrong, Thyatira. And you can read about her in Acts 16, 11 to 15. You remember she was the first European convert to Christianity that we know by name. There were some who apparently had gone to Jerusalem and heard about the message there and gone back, for example, the people who established the, the Christian church in Rome, but we don't know them by name. We don't know who they were. Well, what happened in this period of time between 538 and the 1560s? It's a long period, isn't it? That's more than a thousand years. And we call, call it the Dark Ages? We call it the Dark Ages. Uh, why do we call it the Dark Ages? Good question. Why do we call it the Dark Ages? Because <laughs> there was no yeah. Just ask the martyrs. <laughs> well, let me, yeah, exactly. A lot of martyrs uh, and so forth. Um, there's an, this was the time of the Walden Seas. For those of you, we don't have the time to talk about the Walden Seas, but there were a few small groups hidden away in mountains and areas in different parts of the world trying to, to stay true to the Christian message. And the Walden Seas was one, one of those groups. Yes, Dennis. This was a period of suppression of individual thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. That you accepted what the church said mm -hmm. or you were a heretic. And the church would, I mean, they had meth, they would, they would uh, declare some, I mean, even a whole city, if it was, wasn't doing what they wanted to do, they would declare an interdict. And that meant you couldn't get married, you couldn't bury someone who was dead, you couldn't be baptized anybody. I mean, the church tr had a stranglehold on, on European civilization for that whole time period. Is that what's kind of taken of here in verse 20 of, of that message? Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman, mm -hmm. and a woman in this uh, thing it would be a church, Jezebel, mm -hmm. that doesn't sound very good, very good, which calleth herself a prophetess. So she's playing church to Believe that she can speak on right. God's behalf. To teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Yes. You know, yeah. most, all these churches that we read have that problem with, uh, yeah. of the Nicolaitans. Uh, so yeah. that that just means it is in the the fornication, marriage, uh, mixing up corruption with true corruption with true things, yeah. and that was just the height of this. Church. And uh, let me just illustrate something that I learned way back in my college days, and I'll never forget it because it, so, it hit me so hard when we studied it. They they started universities in Italy in those days. And they had a huge argument in one of those universities about how many teeth a horse has. Now, you might say, well, that's easy. You go out and you look at the horse and you count his teeth, right? Oh, no, no, no. That's not the way you do it. There was one authority, and I've forgotten what their names were. One authority said the teeth had this many, a horse had this many teeth, and another authority said the horse has this many teeth. And they argued endlessly about which one of these authorities is right. You don't go out and look at the horse, you accept authority. That's the way it's done. That's the way study is done. I mean, you don't think for yourself, you accept what someone else teaches you. That sounds kind of modern. <laughs> I hope it's not quite that bad. <laughs> it, it was a period of 
fighting Christian against Islam, Christian mm -hmm. against Christian, mm -hmm. the freedom, physical freedoms we know today, so far we still have them, but they mm -hmm. didn't have anything like it then. Mm -hmm. Mental freedom you just talked about, mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, at suppression. And you could be, as you said, you could be anathema, mm -hmm. and you were cut off. Yeah. Well, there's an interesting bit at the end of the prophecy on Thyatira. It says, I will also kill her followers. And then all the churches will know that I am the one who knows everyone's thoughts and wishes. I will repay each of you according to what you have done. Does that sound like a judgment scene? It sure does. Yes. It does, doesn't it? It sounds like Psalm 62, verse 12 in the Old Testament, which says, and that his love is talking about God, that his love is constant. You yourself, O Lord, reward everyone according to his deeds. Yes. Yeah. Deeds, works, yeah. what you do. Yeah. And Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 is probably the most famous verse that says like something like that. After all this, there's only one thing to say. Have reverence for God, obey his commands, because that is all that human beings are created for. God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. So uh, there's, there's some judgment, it sounds like, coming up, right? Yes. Okay, Sardis. Sardis considered itself impregnable. Somewhat like Pergamon, it was located on a mountain spur. The main part of the town was perched close to a thousand feet above the valley floor at the top of almost perpendicular cliffs. In ancient times, the proverbially wealthy monarch, King Coesus of Lydia, chose Sardis as his capital. He felt that his enormous treasure was safe there. Coins were first minted in Sardis. No army could surmount the city's protective precipices. But Cyrus the Great in 547 BC took Sardis and his treasure away from Coesus and Anti pronounce that please. Antiochus. Antiochus the Great in 2018 BC conquered the city again. In each case a hardy volunteer scaled the wall scaled the warlike escarpments and open the city gates from the inside, while the population, feeling perfectly safe, was sound asleep. Does that sound like any stories in the Bible? <laughs> what? Babylon. Babylon, they came in under the walls. They, they thought they, you know, the army came under the walls. But there was a time, a city that was conquered by someone scaling a wall up to uh, a, a little place and, and got into the city and conquered it. And that city was Jerusalem. That's how David conquered David. Jerusalem. Yeah, David. yeah. Same story. So, um, thank you, Yoli. Um, Sardis was one of those places just, I mean, they thought they had the world by the tail and no one could do anything to them. And someone just crawled up there and opened the gates and said, come on in. It's like that. Sounds a little bit like the ancient story of Troy, doesn't it? But it, it's got a problem. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. They had a false sense of security, yeah. the inhabitants, thinking that their, their walls were impenetrable and no one could capture them. But someone snuck in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Verse 4 says, Thou hast few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me, in, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Okay. Just a few names. And what... Uh, this is a little troublesome because what time period do we think this covers? Starting from the Protestant Reformation down to around the 1790s seemed to fit this church. Why would it say just a few names? I thought this was a time of great Christian enlightenment and so forth. Anybody know? Any suggestions? in like you said. What? Something must have crept in. Something must have crept in. What we find as we look at the history of the Christian churches that those first groups, the Martin Luthers and the, you know, the Cal John Calvins and those other people, you know, they were great and the people right behind them, they were excited and boy, they were out there and they were, you know, they were 
facing the, the the giant, you know, the the Catholic Church, and they were dealing with all these issues and so forth. But then, before they died, they established creeds, mm -hmm. and they said, "This is what you have to believe. Just this. This is it." And the people came along, said, "Yes, okay, we believe that," and everything just sort of just sort of ground to a halt. There wasn't any great revolutions. There were no, I mean, no great progress in in in, in theology. No no big theologians that sort of followed along. Now there were a few. Uh, there were the Wesleys, for example, came along later and started Methodism. But by and large, the church was after this huge wonderful thing in, in, with the with the Protestant Reformation, things just sort of... Kind of like the second and third generation? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The main, if I'm correct, the main theme is repentance, no? Through yeah. all of them. Yes. Uh, one question. Uh, on this, when this says, I will never blot out his name, her name, from the book of life, is that referring to once save, always save? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think what it really means is this. God is telling us that from every one of these churches, there's going to be some who are saved. And another question, let's just pop it in right here. Um, some have suggested that maybe these churches represent different types of people, different Christian experiences, and that there are some people who will be saved with an Ephesus experience, some people will be saved with a Smyrna experience, and so forth, down through the list. And that's another possibility. It's not likely that everyone in a certain time period is going to have the same exact kind of Christian experience. Well, if you take the whole population of a, of a church, mm -hmm. there are people in various stages of their Christianity, and you could relatively easily uh, take these messages and point to those things, or even in your own life at different times mm -hmm. in your own life you may represent one or more of these. Now you started us off by reading about the church of Laodicea. That's supposed to represent the final church, which would be the church in our day. Yeah. But certainly none of us would be so naive as to say the experience of everyone in the world, or even every Christian in the world, is the same in our day. So there are, there are these differences. So we're, we're giving overall pictures. We're suggesting that the majority of Christians today might fit the Laodicean picture. Mm. Not all of them. So, okay. There's a church that probably the shortest one of all in terms of its length of existence is spoken about in Revelation 3, 7 to 13. Gordon, I think that's you. So reading again, as we have from Mervyn Maxwell's book, uh, God Cares, Volume 2, Not many miles southeast of Sardis lay Philadelphia, located near Thyatira, on a broad hill between two fertile valleys. One of the valleys offered a natural gateway, an open door through the mountains eastward, contributing considerably to Philadelphia's commercial success and cultural influence. Like the other cities in our list, Philadelphia was shaken by earthquakes from time to time. The Philadelphians apparently became particularly nervous after one of these earthquakes, living in the surrounding fields in huts and booths during the long periods of aftershocks. Of course, we don't know anything about aftershocks here in No, California, California not at all. <laughs> yeah, but they, they live in a place where there's a lot of earthquakes. You know, there was an earthquake, a while, not all that long ago, I mean, in, in terms of all of history, in, in Turkey, which was the same area, and there were like 75,000 people died. And it was, you know, they have some pretty horrendous earthquakes there. Not real often, but I mean, that's part of the Great Rift Valley that goes all the way down to Palestine and down into East Africa, where I used to live. Interesting. So, no, no criticisms of this church in yes. this message. And I think that's very interesting. Let's, let's actually read those verses. Revelation 3, 7 to 13. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, This is the message from the one who is holy and true. He has the key that belonged to David, and when he opens a door, no one can close it, and when he closes it, no one can open it. I know what you do. This is God speaking. I know what you do. I know that you have a little power. You have followed my teaching and have been faithful to me. I have opened a door in front of you, which no one can close. Listen, as for that group that belongs to Satan, 
those liars who claim that they are Jews but are not, I will make them come and bow down at your feet. They will all know that I love you, because you have kept my command to endure. I will also keep you safe from the time of trouble which is coming upon the world to test all the people on earth. I am coming soon. Keep safe what you have, so that no one will rob you of your victory prize. I will make those who are victorious pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which will come down out of heaven from my God. I will also write on them my new name. If you have ears, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So what time period is this and what's unusual about it? I don't know of any time when the church <laughs> had no problems. <laughs> no, there was no time when it had no problems at all. What was happening in the 1790s? French Revolution. Great Awakening. Yeah, the French Revolution was in full steam. Yeah, that's a, that was a scary thing. But something else had happened. In 1755, there was that huge earthquake called the Lisbon, Lisbon earthquake, earthquake off the coast of, and, and affecting much of Europe and some of North Africa. Then in 1780, there was a dark day. In 1798, the Pope, you know, the, the head of the Catholic Church, was, which was supposed to be this dominant force in Europe, was taken prisoner by Berthier, one of Napoleon's generals, put in prison, and within the year he was dead. And it looked like things were completely changing. Everything was different. Protestants rose to the occasion, and in the first few days of the 1800s, they started Bible societies, and they said, it's our job to carry the, the gospel not just to Europe and, and maybe North America and Australia, where there's already Caucasian kind of people living, but we really need to be reaching out to people all over the world. And they started sending missionaries to Africa and, and India and China and South America and so forth. And this was a time of great awakening, and Bibles were being translated into different languages and, and spread across the world. So it was a, a tremendous time. But something else really important happened during this time. What was that? The end of the 2300-day prophecy was coming about shortly yeah, toward, uh, toward the end of that period. True. And what happened before that? Well, you got the Mormons, you got the United States in 1776. Began. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of, uh, of course, we mentioned the uh, French Revolution. We had a but great revival of of people, religious thought and religious investigation. Well, b people started reading their Bibles because of this dark day and the, and the earthquake and so forth, and they knew about the prophecies in the Bible that predicted that. And during the first half of the, 18th cent of the 19th century, there were a lot of new inventions. There was a steam engine, and there were beginning of factories and so forth. And everybody looked around and said, wow, you know, things are just improving. I mean, we must be approaching the end of the world. And people got excited about reading their Bibles. And, 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 you know, as I already mentioned, the missionaries were going out and so forth. And so it was a time of huge religious revival. And riding on the, on the, on the crest of that was the Millerite movement. That, and, and he wasn't the only one. William Miller is one of the most famous ones. But there were similar movements in Europe and South America and so forth. Looking at the scriptures and looking especially at Daniel and saying, look, there's evidence that this, our world is coming to an end. 1844, maybe that's the day when Jesus will come back. And so all of that happened during this brief time of the Philadelphian church. And the whole world, I mean much of the world, had taken, was taking very seriously uh, the scriptures during this time. So it did seem like a great time of awakening and open doors and so forth like that. So the letter was written to the church, not to those who don't claim anything about no. Christian. No. And so the church at that time looked pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it's also fair to say that even earlier people knew about the prophecies. Sir Isaac Newton yeah. got into this kind of thing. King James for the King James Bible, he was a very erudite biblical scholar apart from all the others we knew. Yeah. And you we we forget the influence of that Bible, but the, before it even hit America, your early people here came in with the Geneva Bible. Mm -hmm. That had, there was enough in these Bibles for people to know, and it's yeah. sort of come to fruition and then died off. Yeah, well. Not, but never completely. Yeah. And if you look at England, I think I'm right, it was the Wesley Brothers that basically stopped England having a revolution like the French did. Yeah. If it hadn't been for those two guys, England would be no more today, probably. Yeah. 
high, very possible. Yeah. yeah. So what we see here is a time of a real religious revival and, and, and awakening and so forth like that. Um, so what happened in 1844? End of the 2300 days. The, the, 20 the prophecy of, of Daniel 814 comes to an end. Uh, you mentioned uh, Sir Isaac Newton. He, he read Daniel and Revelation. He tried to put it all together. and He predicted that the end of the world was going to come somewhere about 300 years after he was dead. Mm -hmm. And Martin Luther, by the way, said something similar. Yeah, yeah. He had the idea that the world would come to, to, come to an end about 300 years after he died based on his reading, but they, didn't, they hadn't figured out the dates business. Right. So then what, happened, what happens with the last church? You read it to us about the Laodiceans. They were in pretty bad shape, weren't they? No, it must have been a real downhill slide. <laughs> <laughs> well, Careful, what, that's us, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yea, verily. You want to read us to us about what uh, it they, says about the, the city of Laodicea, Norm? Laodicea, the seventh and final city on Christ's correspondence list, was a business person's paradise. It was enormously wealthy, wealthy and was proud of the fact. When an earthquake laid the city low around AD 60, Laodicea did not, like other towns, accept disaster relief from Rome. Instead, it rebuilt itself at its own expense. Much of Laodicea's wealth came from the commercial and banking interests. Significantly, inexpensive black wool, soft and glossy, was marketed there and processed into prized garments and rugs. Laodicea was also famous for a medical school and for the eye ointment made from local ingredients. It was a resort town, too. Hot springs bubbled out of the hills a few miles to the south. By the time the hot water reached the city via an aqueduct, it had become lukewarm, stinking to drink, but just right to bathe in. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very good. Well, does this remind you of anything that you read earlier at the beginning of our session? Well, black uh, wool, eye, eye ointment, eye. and white ointment instead of black wool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's quite a contrast, isn't it? it is. Yeah, and here the lukewarm water. What about the lukewarm water? Said does I that, will spit you out of my mouth. Is what the Bible? Yeah, says. It, it, was it was nauseating. It was nauseating. Yes, yeah. The, the angel of the church of Laodicea received a message from his congregation that they should buy gold, received a message for his congregation, that they should buy gold refined by fire. To people who thought they were rich, he presented himself, this is Christ, as a source of true riches. The gold also represented the faith and love that God wishes for his Christian children. The white garments represented the righteous deeds of the saints as opposed to the black wool. And the eye medicine represented the Holy Spirit. The lukewarm condition of the Laodicean church is the worst of the deadly sins afflicting the churches. Now, we've been reading about the synagogue of Satan. We've been reading about the Nicolaitans. How can this um, lukewarm church be worse than those things? Because they've had more light. They've had more information. Okay. And, and we already read that, you know, in fact, Luke 12, I'm, I'm sorry, Luke, um, John 12. 47 and 48 tells us, you know, the more you, in, good information you have, the more you're responsible the for. The more you're responsible for, yeah. And it's true that the word there is talking about, spit you out of my mouth, the Greek word is a metal, which means literally to vomit. Is it possible that our Christian behavior today could make God nauseated? Yes. Not only is it possible, it says it's happening. Mm-hmm. Now we need to figure out why. Can anybody name me 10 things in the church that would make God think this? We could work on that. <laughs> Gordon. Ken, what are we supposed to get from the messages to the seven churches? What's the overreaching theme or? Okay, we have seen several things. One, we have seen God has some hope for every church. It's not, there's none of these churches that's totally gone. There's a little bit of hope at least for each of these churches. We've seen, we've seen over what appears to be a, a, a history of ups and downs in the Christian church from the days of John up to our day. Um, 
I think one of the important things is to recognize that these churches represent the, the history of the, of, the, of the Christian church, those who specifically claim to be Christians down through time, and there are seven of them. Now we're going to learn, if we haven't learned it already, that the book of Revelation is full of sevens. We're going to go next to the seven seals, which seems to be talking about nations and the, what, what those nations do in, that are the claiming to be Christian nations but what, or, or claim to be uh, religious nations at least. We're going to see what that, that happens. Um, but there were a few things that, that happened during this time that were good. The church, through several major convocations, determined that we were not going to become Arian. We're not, we do not believe that Christ uh, was born literally and that he did not pre-exist. The, the church decided that God was, that Jesus was truly God, and a later convocation they decided that Jesus was fully man. So there were some correct statements made. And, and we know, and without reviewing all the, the history down through the years, that there was the Protestant Reformation, which certainly opened the Bible to the world, and that's probably the major thing it did, although they may not have accepted everything and, and done all the things right. Nevertheless, they did make Bibles available to people in their own languages, so uh, the ordinary people could read and understand. Um, during the Philadelphia period that we've talked about briefly, there was a great explosion in Christian work, as we have mentioned. It was a time when the Bible began to be translated and spread throughout the world. William Miller helped to focus attention on the prophecies of the Bible. And during the Philadelphia and Laodicea periods, there are two doors discussed, an open door, and heaven and a closed door on earth needing to be opened. And the closed door that needs to be opened is symbol of Christ knocking at the hearts of every one of us, saying, I'm not going to force my way in. I'm not going to, you know, get in there whether you like it or not, but I stand at the door and I knock. And I'm inviting every one of you, especially you Christians that are reading this book, to open the door and come in and we will eat together and we will become friends, and you can be real Christians following such an experience as that. Hope you enjoyed this time together. We'll see you next week.